Position have among us Mr. Pramodhan, Vice President, Supply Chain Management, Team Limited. Sir. May I now request Dr. K.K. Valuri, Director BITM, to welcome our guest with the flowers. Right thoughts and right efforts inevitably bring about right results. A very good morning to one and all present here. I feel really grateful to introduce to you our esteemed guest, an epitome of excellence and hard work. Mr. Pramod Sant, Vice President at Siemens Limited, heads the Import-Export and Export Control and Customs for the South Asia region. He brings more than 30 years of experience in supply chain management, procurement, logistics, and foreign trade. Heading Import-Exports and Logistics for Siemens Limited and group companies, he handles more than 38,000 shipments and is a top importer at Air Cargo Complex, Mumbai. Sir has implemented a comprehensive web-based system to track all import-export details as well as KPI for freight forwarders and custom brokers to improve productivity and ensure legal compliance. He has a long experience in handling project cargo, ODC, etc. in India and has established high standards in the same by combining method statements, environment, health and safety. Sir has also published many articles and research papers on supply chain management, import exports, and logistics. He also actively participates in various forums as an advisor, a core committee member, and a speaker to train people. Sir was awarded the prestigious Dynamic Logistics Professional of the Year 2015 at Maritime and Logistic Awards. Sir, I now request you to please enlighten the young and curious minds with your words of wisdom. Good morning, everybody. Morning, and uh, I'm really happy and proud to be standing in front of you and talking on this my subject. It's really indeed, I mean, it's such a good gathering, big gathering of students, I think, really motivating that so many students are really interested into what is happening in the world. Uh, you must have heard my uh, uh, details, biodata. Then there is a word called as, I'm having experience of 30 years, something. So it is actually a wrong word. You can, I always feel that I'm a learner of a supply chain for the last 30 years. Because you will never be really having anything. You will, as a, you will always remember as a student, whether you are working, whether you are in industry. So that is most important, that need to keep that urge to learn continuously is most important. So never say experience, but you say that I'm learning for so many years. If you look at, the, we, we are talking about challenges. So uh, in morning, uh, Colonel Professor Balasubram mentioned that there was a war in the world, and continuously world was at war. And then there is a one word, uh, one terminology, which is very recently came and very famous. And a management student, you will, must be knowing that. It's called VUCA. It's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So this word came from American, as usual. They developed many things. It came in when America went into Iraq. They found that situation is such a confusing in war. 
that the situation was continuously changing, change speed was very high, volatile, uncertainty, you don't know who is your friend, who is your enemy, it's completely uncertain, today somebody is your friend, in the evening he is different, it's a complex to understand the relation between people, between leaders and the groups. And it is ambiguous. There is never a transparency. And they came with this word called VUCA, and the management has already implemented that word. So I feel that today's situation is like VUCA. Changes are happening very fast in India. Every day you will hear that government is announcing new, some new scheme. Still there is uncertainty. The market is not growing. It's a complex. We saw when we will see the trade, when we will see the complex tax net, how complex it is, and sometimes it is ambiguous. So we are in same field as on today. There are too many challenges. You have, if you take any organization, you have internal conflict, political changes, international trade barriers. We have seen Mr. Shikumar talking about it. Environmental changes. There are new pressure, globalization, quality, the most important is shorter time to market and less the product's life cycle. You know you don't use mobile for more than one and a half year. So the new product has to come and the life of any product is very little. Then everybody talks about environment, green, lean organization. So all these things being a pressure and continuous challenge. The subjects are really, at the same time you have to keep on innovating, technology is changing, and in that, how you will survive and to grow is the most important thing. As this is a big topic, I am going to speak only on four key topics. Out of that, I am really going to elaborate only two topics which are really close to my heart. So, first, when we talk about globalization, I mean, you will know globalization has got really the political environment is a challenge. When you do a globalization, you can get a very good orders from African countries but you are not sure whether when you export it, whether you will get money or not. Or when you dispatch it, whether that customer in Africa will really clear it or take it in hand or not, you are not very sure. Legal environment, again in that country is very important that you cannot maybe be able to do a go in Africa and do the case. It will be very difficult to go in Nigeria, find out the lawyers and make a case. Similarly, economic environment, probably yes, in each country, how the economic environment is there, we will have to see. And lastly, the cultural environment in that country. We again saw Mr. Shashikumar explaining in very detail that yes, Uber person is telling that he came to know that in India the laws are not followed. And in other countries, he has to follow the law or he will not be able to start this uh, any business. So same is the case, whether it is a cultural environment. And our culture is very different. So today I am very, really happy to see you as the students and in particular ladies in Indian traditional dress. So which is really rare in most of the B school. And this is really good to have the culture. When we have a good culture, at the same time we are having some drawbacks also. In India, when you deal with any global organization or any outside, you find it very different. I had an experience, I was talking to one of the party and I told him to send some details. I explained to him, okay, these are the details I need. He said yes, and he put the phone down. First, I thought whether he understood what I'm talking. I again rang up and I told him I need this, he said. He said yes, and again put phone down. And then I was worried, what is going wrong? Because in India, we are always repeated, we have to tell urgently. That fellow will again tell, ha, ha, I understood it, I will send it to you today itself, or I will send it in one hour, I will say, both urgent hai. All that thing never happens. And we are bogged down with our culture, so when we deal with globalization, we will have to change. When you talk about supply chain global, you have many changes and a lot of challenges, unknown to unknown and unknown, known and unknown. If you take an example, few years back, there was a, from Iceland, there was a, a volcano from which ash was erupted and there was ash. And the entire Europe, the flights were not flying. You are not able to supply any material you are not able to get any material, which is unimaginable. In today's world, the airport is closed, you are not able to get material from Europe. You cannot imagine. And your supply chain gets really affected because of such unplanned things. Or just look at the last few weeks, which are really turmoil, having terrorist attack. Now, 
Istanbul attack. You know, most of the Indians, when they go to USA, they fly a Turkish airline because it is a cheaper. And when you find that the Turkish airport is shut down, and secondly, the US giving a warning that they will not fly to Istanbul, you can imagine what will happen to your supply chain, what will happen to people which are needs to be deputed to USA. So the supply chain has got really critical nature. Look at the uh, tsunami which affected Japan. Your entire supply chain which was depending on the uh, Japanese ICs or uh, items got disrupted. Same happened with Thailand. Or look at today's situation in Bangladesh, if people are sourcing, a lot many things happen sourcing from Bangladesh. So somebody sitting in Western Europe will not understand what is going wrong in Bangladesh and he will not get the material. So there are so many changes happens. If you look at in India, the, anybody who is sourcing from India, he finds that there is Indian goods in some commodity will be available cheap. But at the same time, he will have the issue of to deal with an Indian bureaucracy or other delays. If you have heard of our, and most of the export by sea, they are depending on port called JNPT. And in JNPT, when you will read the news, you will find that most of the time there is a congestion or the export trucks which are going there, the queue is 15 kilometers to 20 kilometers, sometimes reaching up to 30 kilometers. So this delay is not envisaged by a buyer or a importer in Europe and when he sees this, he loses its confidence and there is a challenge. So when you do any global sourcing in supply chain, you find these points which sometimes you are not able to control, some are controllable. There are many things which uh, few, uh, I will only elaborate few things which are the cost in India. Yes, labor cost is less, but efficiency of our labor is very low. So somebody who is doing the job abroad in few hours, here we will take more. Or for every work, you will have more people at any place. You go to hotel, you will find three, four people, different people. One is only coming to give water, one is taking order, one is serving the food, one is cleaning the table. Whereas outside, only one person will be doing this work for more number of customers. So you have a lower advantage of labor rate, but you have an efficiency issue custom duties, export regulations. This is the one topic which is very important that there are export regulations about the nuclear treaty. The nuclear treaty also. So India is not able to import, get the items which are covered in the US list or European list. So there are export regulations when you deal with a global supply chain. Uh, Sometimes then there is, when you do a sourcing, there is a local content requirement. If you have heard recently that when India wanted to do a solar energy in very wide scale, the government was trying to put a restriction that anybody who is globally coming, he should have more local content. And there was a fight, and this fight is lost by Indian government. And uh, USA has won that there is no local content requirement for the solar uh, energy area for any m company. The taxes, lead time, cycle time, I, these are all the things which affects. And as I was mentioning, the culture. When you deal with global sourcing, you have a cultural issue. When you deal with Japanese, it is totally different. Japanese people will come in team. The decision will be taken by highest person. In meetings, the junior people will never speak. Only the senior will speak. If junior will align with boss, if he has to speak, it's a Japanese. Korean culture is again a different. Chinese culture is again a different. If you go to US, you know most of our relations are with USA or Europe, where it is much more clear and how to deal with that. So to bring in the culture, when you are doing a globalization, this is one of the challenge. You cannot treat everybody with same. If you are dealing with a USA person, you will do it differently. You will, when you are in Europe, in Europe also you, you deal with German. I have been working with German companies, totally different. In German company, the typical German person, he will do his own work. You will find at 10 o'clock, he's sitting in front of me, he will open his tiffin and he will have his 10 o'clock snacks. He will not ask you also and he will have his snacks. You may be talking to him, you are in that department working for one month 
on Friday, he will find that he will say, bye, I'm going on leave from tomorrow for 10 days, and he's on leave. Of course, he has informed his boss, but he will not tell. So what German shares is different, when you go to UK, it is different. So in globalization, the challenge is culture, dealing with culture. You go to Middle East, it's completely different ball game. how you, when you are doing a business. So in globalization, culture is an issue which will be there. On globalization, if you look at what challenges or how to deal, I'm pretty sure you are much more having into the knowledge when you deal on the books and whether many challenges, so I will not go into that. I will come to point college trading across border. Sir, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But what happens is that the most important is that if you are American and when you want to develop or get the things manufactured as a subcontract from Bangladesh, you will have different skill requirement. If you go to China and do something, you will require a different skill. I am pretty sure that's why I've shown the America as a thing because we know sometimes more America than India also. And I am quite sure most of them exactly know that which are the distances, which are the cities, which are the universities, their ranking, where the jobs are available, which we know more than sometimes more Americans. <laughs> and, and that is why what happens is that why USA become the most important nation and why it is the biggest economy and why they are able to rule the world is because of the culture and the work how they do. Uh, in trading across border there are some topics which I will cover trade barriers, ease of doing business, logistic performance index, and free trade agreements. When you are doing any global business, there are different kind. Market access, we talked about first time that yes, some government puts the restriction that our fruit products, say for example, the mango, you cannot sell into each country across the world. There are some restrictions that government has put. For example, another is the silk saris which are very important for India, but you cannot export to many countries because there are regulation that the silk catches the fire very fast and it is risky. So government has put restriction on such. They are nothing but a, uh, what you call as a non-tariff barriers. Border administration, this is also one of the barriers. If you are sending some material to Korea, in Korea it will get cleared from their custom in two hours to five hours. But if you want to send something to Bangladesh, it will take 10 to 15 days to cross Indian border and get into Bangladesh border. Similar way, USA will require that material which you are dispatching, they know before it leaves the India, what are you sending, how you are sending. So there is a border administration. Telecom and transport infrastructure. Yes, I think India has come really the great way across the world. We have now good telecom structure, which is helping us but our transport infrastructure is really having problems, which we will see now. And the business environment, you will find that everybody coming to India still say that, no, our government is not moving at fast speed. We need more easy ease of doing business. And even though government is taking a lot of steps, there is a still regulation which are much more critical. So these are the trade supply chain barriers to the trade. And Indian tax environment is very hostile. If you read the newspaper, there will be case, everybody will be talk about what is happening in the case of Vodafone. If you are reading the newspaper carefully, you will find that the Sony was fined for 350 crore they have paid because they have not used some free trade agreement right way. You will find the cases of against every company, IBM there will be cases, Microsoft, the way which they distributed the licenses. So the tax environment in India is very hostile and aggressive. And the people in government, they want the big companies to be nailed down. 
they are more interested into big audits and other things. It is not that the government is, or the officers are interested into small bribes and taking here and there. They go, they do detailed analysis, they study properly, and they make a case which is happening and which is increasing more. Ease of doing business. I think this will be the, our ranking. Everybody has been knowing that, yes, India has, in 15 World Bank ranking, India has come to 130 rank, and we have moved close four uh, steps ahead. But there is a, this ranking has got various other ranking and the trading across border, which is most important for supply chain, our rank has deteriorated to 133. And what is that rank means, trading across border, is that it is worked out that how much time it is taken for import, how much time it takes for export, how much is the cost for import, and how much is a cost for import. And if you are at Mumbai, hot could be. If you are at Delhi, how much? So the distance from frontier is also worked out. And all these things, if you look at what is country number one and country number 133, India, the how many documents are required, how much time it takes for exports, and it is into days, number of days. So on an average, from base case to worst case, if you take the average time taken for export is really very high time taken for import is very high and it affects you. Same is for cost. If you look at China, is also having same bureaucratic ways like India, but their cost, uh, but their cost is really low compared to the uh, uh, India. If in India, if cost of import is $535, uh, then the China is at 319 and that is how the economic of scale they are managing and trading across border, our rank is still low, we have to do a lot of, so any company investing into India or doing business with India will think whether it is easy to do any import exports or to set a factory in India, where do we stand? And the, at the moment, this is a challenging situation. Logistic performance index, this is another global index which World Bank produces. See, there are always debate. India was always in mood to fight Whenever this World Bank report is produced every year, but India was always telling, oh, this is not giving a right picture, this is a perception. Yes, this is a perception, but now two years, government has changed their approach. Instead of fighting against this rank, they are taking steps, they are educating people. I find the customs board or finance ministry and the transport ministry coming and explaining industry in various forum that what are good things which we are doing. Some of you would have seen the full page advertised given by government on what ease of doing reforms they are doing. So this is all to attract and change our image, and which is really good. Now the logistic, the cost in India, they are very high compared to any other developed country. And the cost anywhere goes to 13 to 15%. Our ranking, which was 54 in last month report of World Bank, it is improved to 35 so one is that we have changed the perception, but the reality is definitely not so attractive. There is one very important thing, the share of mode of transport, if you look at, the road is 61, rail is 30, uh, others is 9. You go to developed country like USA or Europe, road is less, 37, rail is higher, others is more. So if you look at Europe, the lot of transportation happened by inland, or the coastal movement. Similarly, the very little by road. Why? Because road is expensive, it creates the pollution, it adds to the uh, more accidents, risks, etc. So in India, whereas we are totally dependent on, on the road transport, which is very high and which needs to be changed. If you look at this pyramid, this is the famous pyramid, how the material should be moved. And it says that if you are having raw materials, bulk material, you should use a rail, coastal, or a pipeline. If you look at our oil transportation, majority of places in India, the oil is transported by tankers, barring few oil uh, uh, pipelines. So you have a tankers, they consume fuel, they meet with accident, all that thing happens. So your raw material cost gets increased because your mode is costly, which is road. The capital goods, big material also still has to go on road. And what actually should be in the principle, 
the consumer goods which are there fmcg retail distribution should be using the road as thing but our pyramid is really inverted in india and unless we have good change into use of coastal ways if you look at we talked about india and that is what uh, uh, my next slide will show we have coastline but we don't use it we have inland waterways possible but we don't use it another problem which is faced is a lot many transport agencies many companies and it was mentioned also in morning by shashi kumar in india you have a one truck you still call it is a logistic or supply chain company this is a problem that any person who is having one or two truck earlier he was having a transport company then he found a management has adopted a word from transport to logistics he renamed his company with a logistic company but having still two trucks then he found that no now buzzword is supply chain then he has changed his company's name to supply chain but still he is having two trucks so in india you will have thousands of individual owners having just take a example of international freight forwarders in india who brings the material by air or by sea you have 7000 plus you can imagine the number of transport companies in india and revenue wise this majority of them will have 90 to 95 that means that business is so fragmented that if the business is fragmented you do not have economic of scale you do not have economic of scale you cannot expect the service levels you cannot have improved it tools you cannot have tracks and track systems because they are small players and this is a problem that market is too fragmented and it will take very long to have consolidation we talk so much about india yes we have the second largest road network across the world but out of that the highways are how much very clear percentage we say that we have a road network rail network again biggest in world but out of that how much is used for carrying cargo is very negligible and why because you do not have reliability i am quite sure if i send a material by road it will reach safely but if i send it through railway it will may get damage it may get theft it may get pilferage or it will never reach the destination so you will not use the rail coastal shipping or inland waterways in management you know once you make some presentation you can use it for some days but in india if you have made a coastal waterways or inland waterways presentation 15 years back still you can show that today also because nothing has changed and hopefully we have a good minister who is understanding this mr gadkari is really going into the depth and trying to have they have come up with sagarmala projects they are looking into waterways how the coastal shipping can be made and there are some improvements if you look at hyundai who was making the car in chennai and they are all taken across the india on the road and you con consume the fuel you take time now they are trying to ship it from chennai it will go to mindra or pupawa by ship and from there it will be redistributed in north so you will save the cost and the fuel so there are things which are happening it is not to have such a negative picture but our country is complex and it requires lot many changes national integrated logistics policy if you look at the developed countries what they have common is that they have the integrated policy what avian civil aviation ministry is doing what railway is doing what shipping ministry is doing what road transport is doing they are all consolidated together to give a comprehensive national policy whereas in india we are trying to do that now at least shipping and transport and port is with one minister mr gadkari and there is a good hope but you have last mile issues you have compared to global standard you do not have the logistic part road is a issue one more important thing is logistic skill development this is very important and i go to many b school and uh, those who are very close to some port or airport also and i ask them uh, any time in your course have you gone and seen how is a port operating how is the jnpt operating or how is a mangalore port operating or do you know if the cargo you are in supply chain those people are in operations and if they do not see physically how the material is coming then what we will know so logistic skill development is a complex every supply chain person want to work into e-commerce today work with amazon or flipkart 
but that is only one part of logistics. The other parts remain to have a big industry, transportation, movements of turbines, movements of uh, the transformers, which are very heavy. And you need very smart uh, the engineers, MBAs, on top of pyramid to make a system, but you need a person to work in warehouse also. You, when you are having e-commerce, you need the person who will design that app or make a good system. But at the same time, you will need a good skilled person in warehouse who will uh, really ensure that the warehouse is used properly. Now, coming back to government, customs, everybody feels that it's a bureaucratic, it's a hindrance, it's a corrupt department, but they are changing very fast. From earlier objective of revenue collection, they are moving out, they are looking into national security, citizen safety and welfare. Everybody knows that the material which was bombs explosion in Mumbai, it came through a port. So the customs, they are getting more equipped to ensure that the really the citizen safety and welfare is there. They are coming with audit based control, risk based evaluation and many more things which are will ensure that the good people will get benefit and the bad people will be punished. Uh, we saw in Mr. Shashi Kumar's presentation the free trade agreement issue. Yes, the world tomorrow will be depending on free trade agreements. The free trade agreement will give concessions when you import from one place to another. And this graph shows that in last 40 years, globally there are 215 plus uh, free trade agreements and these are going to grow only and some of the India is very little part of these free trade agreements. And whatever free trade agreements we have negotiated, they are not really helping or they are not done with the right uh, data and analysis. Uh, you, this is all available in any books or anything. You have the NAFTA, which is there, APTA, ASEAN, uh, where all these free trade agreements, majority of countries, so today if it happens that the material, if you are getting it from Japan because, uh, or Korea to India, it has got lower duties. On one hand, as we see that we have lacked in this negotiation and where the new negotiations are working is the Indian skill, manpower. Today India has got the highest number of youths, highest number of English speaking youths across the globe and for which we need the, our people to go abroad and work. And for that we are discussing that free trade agreement should allow the service. And that was a clear example. Now our lawyer from even top university in India cannot go in Japan and can do a case because they have protected that. And the next uh, thing will be whether it is a Singapore treaty or anywhere, our expertise people to get the job there and increase the service sector there is hindrance from government, but at the same time, they are trying, requesting us to reduce the duty so that their imported material will come in India at lower duty. So we have this, there are advantages, disadvantages. India has got uh, close to around 10 free trade agreements with 18 countries, but again, people are not able to utilize that. There are uh, few challenges. This is the most discussed, and if you look at every week, any economic times or any newspaper, the renegotiation or negotiation issue of RCEP will be coming. And there, the main point is same. These countries are not allowing our service exports to get a good free entry into their countries. And they want their material to be dumped into India. And this fight is going on. And if you will look at the department, which was DGFT. This is a department which gives the data to analyze. And it goes to such a level that which country, what we are importing, what we are, can export, and what are the potentials. Uh, in discussing with any RSAP, there is an inverted duty structure. This is very important. That India has allowed the full finished product at lower duty. That means just, if I, ex I give an example, that if I am importing as an electrical company transformer, the transformer, if I import fully from any developed country, it will have a lower duty. But instead of that, if I try to get a raw materials for transformer, it will have a higher duty. And this is called inverted duty structure. That means the manufacturing in India will take beating because those who want transformer, they will import the transformer at lower duty. 
the Indian manufacturer will have setback because they are getting raw material at higher price and without import some of the things cannot be made. Rule of origin, this is also one of the critical points that how are the products, what is the value add? If you look at material which is coming from Singapore, you know in Singapore there is a very little industry, so there is no value addition in Singapore. So what amount is considered for the country of origin rule? That if you are buying something from Thailand or Korea, then that country should have added 32% value into products. Otherwise they are importing from other countries and they will be dumping in our country. So these are the few of the challenges of RSAP. Uh, trading across border, this is a subject which we have to really, I have to cover into sort type, some part of his, Mr. Shashi Kumar was also telling how are the policies and which are made. But trading across border, if as we see, if it is not done uh, really on the time, uh, properly negotiation with data and analysis, we will have problem. Another thing which we uh, neglect is environment, green and safety. This is very important. And these challenges will be coming more and more. If you look at Today, if you try to do something which is environmental friendly, it is going to increase the cost. But at the end, in India, the customer is not ready to pay that cost. If I say that I am going to use a packing which is environmental friendly and it will get disposed of very fast, so because of that packing, my product cost is going to increase by another 10 rupees. In India, the customer is very reluctant to pay this cost, higher cost because of green, this thing. If you take a simple example of your visiting cards, the visiting card, if you try to have a green visiting card, which can be again reused properly, it is costlier than a normal visiting card, which is not so environmental friendly. But majority of things which we try to have is uh, not green only. The compliance, everywhere you will find that the industry or even the hotels or many this thing, how they deal with their waste, how they will be uh, 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 treating their uh, water after uh, use is always a problematic. And to do this compliance, people do not want to follow the rules. Bureaucracy is not able to implement these rules and we have a problem. The fines and penalty, if you violate the environmental law or green laws, they are very negligible. Companies do not really care for that. This is what is happening. But only one uh, hope, which is very good, is that the new generation and the people, they are more and more interested into environmental friendly. They care or people look at the product, yes, this is a product which is environmental friendly, this is a product which is non-environmental friendly and try to select that. You can imagine the problem which we India will be facing because you are having so many people who are using mobiles which all get discarded after one, one and a half years and the e-waste which we are producing whether it is a desktop, moving to laptop, from laptop to iPads and to smartphones and changing smartphones, every one and a half years, we are going to generate a huge e-waste and which is going to affect us uh, definitely. <coughs> uh, green initiatives, they are not only for supply chain. How you design your product, how you produce your product, from where you purchase, there are rules in other countries that they cannot get a raw material from some countries in Africa where there is a child labor is used. Or some countries in Africa where you are having already the civil commotion is going on and there is a military rule. Many companies do not allow raw material procurement from such countries and there is a restriction on that. Packaging, yes, we talked about that environmental and warehousing how you can make the energy efficient warehouses, buildings, and get that certified, and logistics needs to be a gr uh, completely green. Mm. I come to the last point. It's very difficult to cover the challenges in one hour. We are facing the challenges for our whole of life and uh, trying to solve, and everybody is trying to solve that. So I'm only covering really brief, but I would expect more. As I see the question and answer in last session was controlled, so I would like to have more questions because it needs to be more interactive. I think everybody knows Peter Drucker. 
perfect. Now we are on tune, absolutely. And if you look at, there are books which are written few years back and they're still valid and Peter Drucker is one of them. What he wrote several years back today, still a part of our curriculum, still a part of our life and still is going to be there. So such books or such personalities, they are very important and you will see some of the books on finance which are still 100 year old. The wealth of nation is today still valid. So uh, this is what he has said a few years back that our jobs are going to change. We need to have more knowledge and this knowledge will only will help us and uh, will ensure that we will survive. Uh, how many of you have you read this, The Age of Discontinuity? Okay. The, what you will see that these challenges are to be taken at two different levels. One is individual. You know that when you are in B school, first of all what matters is what B school rank is overall in India. And every year there is a magazine, they come up with survey that yes, my B school rank is so much and people really work hard to ensure that this rank is bring, brought up and up so that you have, so your competition start. Our competition start from you join your nursery school till you are passing out any B school. You look for the ranks, you look for everything and the, the most important is that any B school today, if you look at now today Sunday you are having lecture you are continuing, but tomorrow I think again morning you will continue with college and you may have some test also. So this is what is going to happen and that is what going to put you onto pressure continuously always. And when you leave the college also, you will find in industry it is going to be same. You will have hundreds of parallel projects. If you are in IT or you are in some multinational, you will see you will get up. If you are multinational is from Japan, you will be getting up at 4 o'clock and at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock you will have a call. If you are dealing with USA, you know you may have to work in shift definitely. So this is what is going to happen at any time of time you will have high deadlines, workload which is very high, then demanding customers. In all these challenges, I am pretty sure because there is a lot of student from sales, the previous speaker would have considered the customer behavior and demand into great depth that the customer is so demanding that there is no challenge. I will give an example of uh, my own company. We are into healthcare, so we supply to the hospitals machines called at CT scanner, MRI, which are very important. And these are, these do a critical test on patients. If you, if these machines, again, we have less hospital, less hospital have these facilities, patients are more. So the uptime of this CT or MRI is close to around 98%, they have to be kept up. You can imagine that uh, somebody's operation is, critical operation is planned next day morning, five o'clock. So in evening, these tests are done, reports are in night available fresh, and doctor takes decision how to take this operation. If this machine is down, what will happen? So the keeping this machine working is a challenge. Now in India, we have a different thing. You have machines which are imported 15 years back. You have machine which is released last month in USA also is having in India. So you are, have to maintain something which is 15 year old to the latest. And how to keep these pairs? Again, we do not have so much uh, inventory you cannot keep. So these pairs comes from abroad continuously. Some spares you keep in stock, some spares you cannot anticipate. So you get the spares every day from Frankfurt or from Singapore, wherever they are available. And globally these spares are, it's same with other countries, we are not exception. So in USA there is one spare center, one in Germany which caters to the other part and Singapore caters to the other part. So these spare parts are ordered every day and you get it every day to keep the machine up based on what is happening. And when we were in having in India some 100, 200 machines, it was easy. It was possible to meet a customer demand. But when this has become 2,000 and 3,000 CT scanner machine, you cannot keep this running. So what is finally done is that you came with an integrated system which is based on a smartphones, but this is implemented really three years back when we were not calling them as a really smartphone. When you are, any customer failure comes, it is on call center, 
system gives the indication that which customer, which machine is problematic. System allocates the engineer who is well trained. So all engineers history has been put onto computer that who has attended which machine, who is trained in this machine. And so uh, the engineer has been allocated. Same thing happens in India. If a person is good, he gets overloaded. So the engineer who are working well, they will get more calls from customer. So the system prevents that he should not be working more than 45 hours per week. So the call will go to the next experienced person. Then this person will have an indication that what is gone wrong with that machine. Well, he will be traveling. So from a handset, so we will come to know when he reaches the customer, he will check the machine and he will diagnose it. Probably he is able to repair it with what spares minimum he carries with him. But if not, he is able to check the availability of spares. The spares available in Bhivandi, spares available in Singapore or in Frankfurt. And he will order from his handset the spares. And you will not believe that supply chain works if you order the material by 1 o'clock Indian time, which is Germany is 9 o'clock. 9.30 the parts are taken out, they go to airport. 12.30 there is a Lufthansa flight from uh, the Frankfurt, Mumbai. It catches the flight. Before the material come in night on same day in 1 o'clock, the custom clearance can be done because you can file the advance document. Shipment is cleared and next day morning, by 10 o'clock, the material is removed from aircraft, it is segregated, you are able to deliver it across the India, uh, and the supply chain works less than 24 hours. So customers are demanding. So when you give them 95% time, they will ask for 98 and 99. So customers are demanding. Global competition, if you don't do, somebody else will go, going to do that. Uh, high degree of flexibility. I think this is the most important thing. Sometimes we take a very stand that I will not do this, but flexibility is most important. And last not but the least, the continuous learning. What we have learned yesterday may become obsolete and we need to learn uh, that. Uh, general, uh, when you, it is a leadership, because today maybe when you will join industry, you will join as an individual contributor, but in a few years you will take a leadership role. And how you will handle the leadership, it's important. Again, on leaderships, you will have a lot many books and other things to study. I will touch upon only one topic of diversity. And I was glad that when uh, Colonel Professor Balasubhraman mentioned in morning that the students are from 30, all the 30 states in India. So I wanted, when you will work with organization, what, should, what will the diversity, I will try to explain you. So what in Siemens we call as diversity is to have a better person who is right to, to best to do the job will be selected, irrespective of whether he belongs to any country, whether any caste, community, and uh, this is how the person will be selected. And this is how the diversity definition at Siemens. At Siemens, we value, uh, the, the value diversity as the inclusion and collaboration of different thinking, backgrounds, experience, expertise, and the individual qualities across all organization levels and dimensions. So what does that mean? So Siemens operate more than 200 countries already. We say we are in less countries than Coca-Cola, but we are one of the company who works in so many countries. Then our top management includes people from 112 countries. We have people in company for 169 nationalities. And every year when we recruit, we recruit from 122 countries. And last few days on our intranet, we saw that they have recruited first person from Afghanistan. There is a girl from Afghanistan who wanted to, she asked, asked for asylum in Germany. And she was in asylum in Germany and she was selected based on her merits and she is in now Siemens. And that becomes a diversity news also. 24% of workforce is women. I am really happy here the 50% are girls, uh, but in corporate to have 24% women, which is the engineering industry is a, definitely a tough. In IT, you can have more. In banks, you will have definitely much higher. But a uh, diversified engineering company to have 24% workforce is uh, also achievement, and we are trying to improve that. Then it comes to the age. The new hires, they are of all generation Y, which we say that you people. The average globally across age is 41 years. There are still 26% employees are 50 plus years like me. 
and uh, but the new workforce which is emerging if you look at some of the areas where you need always experienced people and uh, uh, it is important so you will have in r and d in technology related areas definitely some means experienced people what happens but in different countries it's different in india the 70% employees are y generation that means that in india siemens the average age is not 41 but 34 years and this is what we have every year who is is getting recruited virtually more than 90% are the young people and today we are having 70% of employees with generation y then when you are multinational it is not the only the age experience and other things but it counts that you have to look into the staff how it is being there uh, different different nationalities different rules regulations there are further complexities to have people who are working whether they are lesbian gay bisexual transgender everything is getting accommodated so when you are dealing national or you are doing in USA or in Germany, you will have different kind of leadership challenges to deal with diversity. And I'm sure it will come also in India that yes, you will have staff under you which is having different, different, not only the states is coming from, not only different religion, but they will be of different thinking, different uh, issues, and you will have to handle them. So the diversity means how you will ensure that this work, people will work in collaboration they and you will get the best result out of it and then Siemens has got the recognition of uh, diversity 100 awards from 2004 on diversity including one from Pakistan uh, we always say that we need to work hard we need to have knowledge but there is most most important thing is that excellence and this is what I will always feel that you need to only ensure that whatever you will do you will need to excel and this is the most important and by which you can take any challenge across. People always feel that, okay, I would have got this job, no, marketing job is very good, I should be in sales, I should be meeting customers. But there will be a person who is in sales office, back office, who will not meet customers and he will say, I got that this job is back office and I'm fed up and this guy, guy is enjoying, he's going from one customer to another, having a good lunch, meeting customers. But unless you do excel in whatever you are doing, I think you will face the problem and you need to have that, you need to have the right attitude, you need to have a good presentation skills, you need to have a behavior which is important and affiliation in order to excel and really get the things into, so if you look at, these are the few things which you can always look at what people have said about excellence. Excellence is to do with common thing into an uncommon way. Perfection has to do with the end product, but the excellence has to do with the process. So how you will do? Today in various companies, the thing is coming that how you have achieved the result is ex definitely appreciated, but how you have achieved the results, whether you planned it properly, whether you did it systematically, whether you followed the rules, whether you made some innovation, this is the important. And th this is the, for me, we know we are talking about challenges at a different level. But if you excel in whatever you do, I am quite sure that you are able to take all the challenges, whether they are for today or they are for tomorrow. So now, uh, if you have any questions. Hello, sir. Sir, so, I am Arjun from Operations Bank, Operations Supply Chain. So my question is that the, all the speakers that we have seen so far, most of them, they have either changed their departments or they either changed their companies. But you haven't changed for last two and a half decades. You have worked your whole corporate life in Siemens. So what made you to do that and what advice can you give, I mean, give us on that record? Is it better to change or what is the advantage of staying in the same company? Okay, so I will answer in two parts. One is why I stuck to this organization. And because today also if you say that, yes, you are working with this organization for so long, then you say that, oh God, he's not getting another job or something like that, it happens. If you look at the organization have changed and then there are some companies, for example, Siemens itself, it has got so many verticals which are totally different. 
and uh, I was initially I was in factory, then I was gone to projects, then I was in corporate department, then I had started heading supply chain. But supply chain for, if you look at, it's so different for each. Healthcare supply chain, I explained to you, was something which is required is hours. But you take a supply chain for a turbine, which is 320 ton turbine, if I have to unload from ship, take it from port to the other part, or if I have to take the 420 ton transformer from my factory in Thana, to the some part of Bihar, it's a challenge. So if you are facing every day new challenges and opportunities are given to you, uh, you can, I have continued with the same organization. But if you look at today's need, I think definitely people need to think uh, that they need to change the job. But I always believe that your first job should give you a good foundation. If you see that if somebody changing your job every two years, then definitely people will not think about him to consider on a really this thing. Because we are quite sure that you will go, first year you will try to learn something, second year you will try to do something or search for a job and leave. So my feeling is that the student should look at the first job, which should give you a good rich experience and learning, which will make a foundation. And which otherwise maybe all people may not like it also, I feel that unless you work sometime into factory area for some time, you will never get a good reality picture. You can always work in e-commerce whenever you want, but to no grassroots, unless you run something in factory, some part of project, then you deal with all the complexities and then you can handle every e-commerce company or anything much easier way. You need to know the reality I ask all supply chain people that uh, if they send any material, what paper is available? I'm quite sure, okay, but I will tell that if you are sending by air, you need an airway bill. Then I ask, have you read any time airway bill that you know somebody charging you higher, lower, what weight, people have not seen. So you need to have your basics clear and then definitely you can change the job because that will give you, today's world is that it will give you much rich experience and good fulfillment. As we are running out of time, this will be the last question. Good morning, sir. Sir, in the last room. Sir, I'm Rashmi from BIMM Operations and Supply Chain Batch. My question is, according to you, what will be the effects of GST and Brexit on logistics? Okay. See, for today, what is the impact of GST on overall working, you know, every big company or a big fire consultant and all the consultant, they are really making seminars and making money on that for full day or two days and good, it's a good business at the moment. The best business is to give a lecture on GST. That is what it is. But it is going to change uh, the way which we are working. It will initially probably have a little more inflation, more complexities. So for one year, definitely our life will be tough but this will be followed by really good growth. A Lot of things will become much more transparent and it will bring clarity. And I'm quite sure that this is a really bold step which will take us to really a new level, definitely. Yeah, but otherwise on GST to tell in, you uh, people are really publishing papers and doing the seminar for one and two days continuously. So it is going to change our life, definitely. And so, uh, so I would like to May I now request Professor D.S. Kadam, Director, Projects and Alumni Affairs, to present our guest with a memento as a token of love and appreciation.